West Lothian, home to around 185,000 people in the fastest growing area in Scotland. A lot of things can be forgotten or lost in time, but you don't have to search very deep to see West Lothian is littered in history. Ancient burial sites over 5,500 years old, Sir James Young Simpson's anaesthetic use of chloroform, once the location of the world's largest oil refinery, but nothing comes close to being enveloped in the mystery as that of an old hospital. Bangor. Never mind rumours, we are going to dive deep into the story behind this forgotten hospital and discuss its history from start to finish and find out what really happened at Bangor. Located in West Lothian, Scotland, Bangor has laid derelict since 2004. For many years, there was discussions as to where the mentally ill should be placed throughout the central belt. A new hospital was desperately needed in response to the increasing prevalence in mental health conditions. Hippolyte Jibloch, a Scottish architect who was known for his Gothic revival style. Born to French parents, Blanc grew up to become an architect, designing many buildings over Scotland. He won the position to design Bangor by a competition. The layout created by Blanc consists of over 30 buildings making up a small village based on the inspiration he had from the German psychiatric village hospital, Alschabitz. The reason for the village layout? To provide a calming atmosphere for patients as if they were at a holiday villa rather than having the appearance to that of an asylum, making it one of Britain's first village hospital designs. The General Board of Lunacy bought the land in 1902 for £13,000. This in combination with construction cost the equivalent of just over £39 million in 2021. The hospital covers 960 acres of land, consisting of a nurse's home, a hospital block and a recreation hall measuring 93 feet by 54 feet with a stage at the north side and a floor for dancing and an orchestra. More than 30 villas are present on the land for which each villa would house 30 to 40 patients. The asylum was not small. general work, like tidying, cleaning, taking stuff to the wards, moving patients, or a uh, sort of down party it was going to the morgue. His was not the farm work as such. It was going round with the mental health patients who collected the brock from all of the wards, and that was taken off to feed the pigs. Often he was called in with some of the other people who were doing general work and labouring work around the hospital uh, to do things like move bodies. <laughs> and we've got one famous story when um, he set off with a, m a man called McBrannan to move a body from one of the, horse the, the long wars at the top of the hospital and it was snow. And they, they collected the body and were proceeding to the mortuary. But when they got to the mortuary, there was no body. 
So they had to go back through the snow, tracing their steps until they could feel where there was a bit of a kerfuffle in the snow and get the body and take it in. After costing £300,000 at the time to construct, Van Gower opened officially at half past 12 on Wednesday the 3rd of October 1906. However, the first patients had already moved in by 1904 and one year later in 1905 there was over 200 patients in residence. Then by the time of its official opening in 1906, Van Gower had 400 patients living there. This gave an inclination as to just how big the facility was to become. such scale, the hospital required many people to man the facility. During the century of its existence, the hospital brought many jobs to the people of West Albion. There was an awful lot between the village and the general. There an awful lot of people there. Maybe a couple of thousand or something like that. Or a thousand and a half. I must remember you had cooks, you had cleaners, you had the nurses, doctors, all the rest of it. All the medical staff. At the forefront of psychiatric medicine, it was a teaching ground for nurses and doctors. Van Gower was running smoothly with many patients being well cared for, carrying out its function as a mental hospital. However, in 1914, that was all interrupted. World War I, a plethora of battle-wounded soldiers, physically and psychologically, were being transported back from Europe as a result of trench warfare. Bullet and bomb injuries were by the plenty. This meant that there was an increased demand for medical staff and supplies. So in 1915, Van Gower Psychiatric Hospital was converted into a war hospital. Psychiatric patients were transported to other hospitals all around the country, making room for over 3,000 servicemen up until 1918. Within the first three weeks under the War Office command, the hospital increased its bed capacity by 500, which at the time was almost double the original capacity. Wounded soldiers arrived daily on the train line, which ran straight into the heart of the village near the boiler house with two platforms. 
as well as bringing in injured men, the train brought coal and other supplies. Today the tracks are no longer there, but the imprint of the line on the land still remains. The tracks ran in from the east side of the village since 1905, but were eliminated by North British Railway in 1921. It was said that 100 patients could be evacuated from the train and into beds within 45 minutes upon arrival. This had to be fast to cope with the influx of patients. The overcrowded asylum consisted of dining areas and rooms packed full of beds. Marquees were set up on the grounds outside, equipped with many more beds for the soldiers, just to try and cope with the overflow. The environment itself was not optimal, however staff members proved to be resilient. The hospital was managed by Lieutenant Colonel and Dr John Kay, the medical superintendent of Bangour Village Asylum. John Kay was said to be progressive in his approach to mental health and very much cared for the well-being of all patients at Bangour, qualities which were rarer in mental health care at the time. Medical staff consisted of one senior surgeon, a senior physician, six surgeons, six physicians, a dental surgeon, a pathologist, a radiologist and their assistants. The nursing staff had a matron who was in command of 150 nurses, 50 sisters as well as nurses under training. A further 50 civilian VAD nurses and orderlies were also in attendance. Guards composed of one sergeant and 12 soldiers, forming a sentry at each of the three entrances to the asylum grounds and standing watch. Many other workers were present at Bangour, such as plumbers, painters, cooks, tailors, shoemakers, and more keeping the village running. Water was supplied from the reservoir to the northwest of the hospital, which cost 25,000 at the time to construct and was reckoned to have a capacity of 16 million gallons of water, which was roughly a five month supply for 1,500 people. Today the reservoir still remains as a fishery. The end of the First World War led to the reopening of the asylum. During the time of 1926 and 1929, the Bangor Church was constructed in gratitude to the hospital and its patients for providing accommodation and treatment to the soldiers. The church dedicated to Our Lady was designed by a Nottingham-born architect. Harold Ogle Tarbolton. This beautiful church still stands today perfectly preserved inside and out. The inscription, Friend, this house of God stands open for thee ever, that thou may enter, rest, think, kneel and pray. Remember whence thou art, and must be thine end, and remember us, then go thy way. Everything seemed like it was back to normal, however this was not to be the case. Bangour would see the effects of the war again in 1939 
which led to its conversion back to a war hospital in dedication to the war effort, although this time there was an addition. The General Hospital. West Lothian finally had a hospital for all medical needs, not just psychiatric, but maternity, plastic surgery and d &E. Before Van Gower was there, any patients had to go to Edinburgh or Glasgow because that was the nearest place for them. And it was an awful journey for wounded, disabled or whatever the case may have been. And as time went on, the war broke out and everything changed. And suddenly there was this new set of buildings going up on the flat land beside the farm and this became Bangor Annex. And it was a great source of work for the local people who went to it. And from early on, there were nurses who came from the army with their patients and they went into the long wards that were there. And I can remember as a small child going to make deliveries to the various patients who sometimes sent money to my parents to pray for eggs that we would take up and go to it. In the burns unit and that was something that was very important because so many of the men that went to the burns unit they have been damaged in the uh, aeroplane accidents, naval accidents. The General Hospital was situated to the south of the reservoir, but northwest to that of the psychiatric village. The top of the hospital had the burns unit and the physiotherapy, whilst to the south side was the maternity ward. Specialising in plastic, facio-maxillary and thoracic surgery, as well as its burns and maternity units, the hospital was world famous at its peak. Other parts of the hospital had tuberculosis wards for many years, providing a place for the infected to reside and be treated. And they would come out there uh, to get their TB cured, and a lot of their time was spent out on at the top end of the hospital, which was up near where the reservoir was, the big wards there, and they were out in open verandas uh, so that they would get the fresh air. And then there was the beginning of medicines coming along that started to help them. But when the TB wards, I once went with my sister to deliver a fowl to one of the nurses that was going back to the Isle of Barra, I think it was. And I was whining and moaning that I was thirsty and I wanted a drink. So I got this drink and it was a beautiful sugar bowl. It turned out I'd come from Woolworths but they were cheap and had three little buttons at the bottom. But the nurses apologised to my dad because it was actually the dish that they used to put the holy water in when the priest came to, to give the last rites. My father was not particularly upset by this. The general hospital was meant to be temporary and was expected to last only 10 years. It by far exceeded this as from its construction in the 1930s to its closure 60 years later. All that remains now are the concrete bases which the General Hospital was built on. Perhaps it was the wars which led to the development of Bangor General Specialised Units, notably the famous Burns Unit, a unit which specialised in the treatment of burn victims and the plastic surgery which may have been required following these incidents. During these times, it was figures such as Professor Norman Dotz who founded a brain injuries unit at Bangor, bringing further specialised treatment for not only the people of West Lothian, but the people throughout the country. The piano was often taken out at Christmas time and it was put onto a trailer and it was taken to the different wards so that they could do their carol singing and have wee concerts and people would get down to the recreation hall for the dances there and that was a great thing, you know, for folk coming up from Bathgate and getting involved in these kind of things.
Psychiatric treatment was still in its infancy during the 20th century, and so treatments ranged from effective to terrifying and even lethal. Many forms of psychiatric treatment were being used, such as the revolution of lithium. Electroshock therapy, still used in some circumstances today, and insulin. During the 20th century, it had been observed that epileptic patients who took seizures did not present with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. This was suggestive that epilepsy was antagonistic to these conditions. This was also noticed when an Austrian psychiatrist accidentally gave a patient too much insulin and the patient proceeded to go into an insulin-induced coma. Upon revival, the patient noted a distinct increase in mental clarity, and so this led to Western psychiatric hospitals beginning induced seizure treatment, or insulin coma treatment. However, by the 1940s, this was replaced by metrazole, a drug which could induce seizures almost instantly. This was not without its downfalls too, as metrazole would produce an intense state of dread in patients, making them feel as if they were about to die. After this, the next evolutionary step in convulsive therapy was the development of electroshock therapy, known today as electroconvulsive therapy, where electrodes were introduced on either side of the patient's head, and they were then restrained whilst a current was ran directly through their brain. This would trigger desired convulsions, Although like many forms of psychiatric treatment in the 20th century, this procedure was overused and even abused. Other forms of treatment included the burning of the brain tissue to control outbursts of rage. But probably the most prolific of these psychosurgical techniques was the frontal lobotomy. Holes were drilled in the skull to allow access to the frontal lobes, and sections were then sequentially removed in hopes of treating various conditions. This technique would be developed further into horrific transorbital lobotomy due to the method access to the brain through the eye sockets. This procedure also went by another name, the ice pick lobotomy. This was because the method was performed essentially using an ice pick. The utensil would be placed under the eyelid of the patient until bone stood as a barrier. Then the mallet was used to strike the ice pick through the bone and into the cranial space. This procedure was developed as it did not require surgical theatre to perform making it more convenient for psychiatric hospitals, which usually did not have surgical theatres. This may suggest that this technique was not performed at Bangor, as Bangor had various specialised units dedicated to surgery. Many sedative drugs were used which brought about Parkinson's-like symptoms. Eventually, Lithium's effects on disorders were discovered and ousted invasive procedures. Occupational therapy involved giving patients work to do at the hospital. Patients were taught skills such as shoe and cloth manufacturing to provide some form of distraction, as well as developing skills that would be of use to them once they left the asylum. One of the very important parts of the hospital's work was plastic surgery, and it's always McIndoo who worked in England who got all the credit and all the information goes out on films was passed about that. There was a Dr. Buchan who lived in Deckment and worked at the hospital, was a very skilled plastic surgeon, and he did so much rebuilding people's faces and skin grafting to make them feel better. And also he became involved with people who had uh, the need to deal with the fact that they were transgender and they did lots of operations very quietly. There was no fuss about that. And the, the National Health Service will have records of these things. But I always feel that he never got the credit that he, he did for it.
Many famous doctors worked at Bangor, including Alexander Burns Wallace, who worked in the hospital during the Second World War. Wallace would go on to be the doctor who published the Rule of Nines in 1951, a technique in medicine used to determine body surface area affected in Burns victims. Other doctors who walked the corridors of Bangor, including Donald McLeod, a pioneering surgeon who wrote a book about the hospital titled The Bangor Story. Pioneering doctors was not a new thing for West Lothian. About 100 years previous, there was Sir James Young Simpson, the discoverer of the anaesthetic properties of chloroform. But Bangower became a place to channel great minds, such as Wallace and McLeod. As Alexander Fleming said, light does not burn until brought to a focus. Although this place was once full of famous doctors, it is allegedly not only famous for channeling great minds. Today Bangour is said to be dark, haunted ruins, infested with spirits and gruesome history. Surprisingly, these talks are not a joke for some. A lot occurred here in the hospital over 100 years, but exactly what is unknown? Accounts say Bangour's Ward 10 had to have a priest perform an exorcism, and other wards were the homes to tormented souls, victims of illness and shell-shocked veterans. Accounts of former staff say that strange things happened in the wards. Feelings of uneasiness. Aye, when I first started here, I was told to watch out for ghosts and weird noises and stuff like that, because it, it was haunted, supposed to be. But I must admit, I never ever saw or heard anything. I've been in different old places, where you get like a cold feeling or maybe hear something. It could only turn out to be a windy or a door or something, but you don't know it. And it immediately brings your mind back to Bangewa, with them saying haunted. How much of this is true, we do not know. But the famous graffiti my mum put me in here and the ha-has that are scribbled over the buildings with broken windows and the smell of dampness do create a dark atmosphere. What is clear is that there is mystery surrounding this hospital, but there are also some unpleasant truths. In 2007, 566 unmarked graves of Bangower patients were discovered. Patients who died and had no family to bury them received a basic burial in an unmarked grave. Bangower may have had a church, but it was unwanted to have a cemetery on the hospital grounds, as this may be unpleasant for other patients. As the 20th century drew to a close, so too did the doors of the General Hospital in the early 90s. In 1974, it was decided that a new hospital would be built, St John's. Eventually, the doors of the Psychiatric Hospital would be closed, and in 2004, this once thriving hospital, at the cutting edge of psychiatric medicine, was left derelict. And it was so different when the hospital closed and it moved to St John's. No, no, I do not agree with Sean. I think it was a part of the history of this area and it should have stayed open. There just was a specialness about the whole place. So... Is that the end for Bangower? 
What happened next? Well, the hospital went on to be the set for the movie The Jacket, produced by George Clooney, starring Adrian Brody, Keira Knightley and Daniel Craig, which was based on a psychiatric hospital. The area has also been used for police and military training. But now, the hospital grounds have been bought over and Bangor is marked to become a village, consisting of homes, flats and a school. This conversion requires the demolition of multiple buildings that were a part of the original design. However, not all buildings will be destroyed as some are destined to be converted into homes and other facilities. Just like in 1902, today there is a rise in mental health conditions and a lack of resources to help. We must reach out, be patient and provide hope and comfort to those who need it.